good morning, or if it's afternoon, good afternoon. I'm here in Los Angeles. Or if you're watching from somewhere else in the world and it's evening, good evening. I am Matan Koch. I am uh, the director of Respectability California and Jewish Leadership, and I have the privilege to be moderating today and organizing our overall webinar series. I work with Respectability, an organization that fights stigmas and advances opportunities so people with disabilities can fully participate in all aspects of community. Um, we are an organization that was founded on Jewish values and base all of our own work in disability inclusion on the understanding of the obligation to make uh, the world a better place and the understanding that every human being was created um, in the image of God, much like all, many of you let Jewish values inform your work, which is of course the focus of today's webinar. I am pleased to welcome you to this series on disability access and inclusion. Now, you'll note that I have specifically not uh, called this our series because we may be hoping to put it together, but it's being offered by a collaboration of more than 40 Jewish organizations listed here and um, is really something that we are pleased to think of as a resource for the entire Jewish world to help them incorporate the talents of Jews with disabilities into their programs, activities, and organizations. We're profoundly grateful to our funders, the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles through a cutting edge grant, the Diane and Guilford Glazer Philanthropies, the Charlton Lynch Christian Family Foundation, the David Berg Foundation, the Stanford and John Alexander Foundation, the Stanley and Joyce Black Family Foundation, and the Beverly Foundation, who have come together to offer this gift to the entire Jewish world. This series is going to cover all of the tools that you need to, prov uh, to practice Jewish inclusion and is, in fact, listed out here. You'll note it continues through August, and you can sign up at the link below. But we are going to um, offer this throughout the summer. And it's important that we do this for the Jewish community because according to the U.S. Census, fully one in five people with America has, has a physical, sensory, cognitive, mental health, or other disability. And yet, at the same time, even though 90% of Jews who responded said that Jewish inclusion was a priority, our nonprofit survey showed that only one-third of organizations are yet practicing inclusion. The study showed us that the will, the will was there, the knowledge was not, and this new free series will fill that gap. Um, we are starting with um, the basis of this series in Jewish inclusion, and we are pleased to offer to you two experts on that topic. Uh, first, Aaron Kaufman, who will speak to this topic from his experience as a Jewish leader doing Jewish advocacy with a disability, and then Rabbi Lauren Tuckman, who in addition to being um, the nation's first blind female rabbi, is also one of the leading experts in the text of Jewish disability inclusion. Their full bios are at the end of this presentation, which we will be happy to provide to you, but uh, that's the overview. At the end of their formal remarks, we will be uh, addressing questions that you have put in the question and answer box, but please feel free to provide those questions throughout the course of the presentation in the box so that we can be collecting them to offer them. Uh, without further ado, I am going to pose my first question to Aaron. Aaron, how does your Jewish identity inform your mission of disability inclusion? 
Well, first of all, uh, someone asked that we advertise that we have captions in, uh, that we're providing captions, so we're providing captions. I also, first of all, just want to say thank you to RespectAbility, uh, one of our favorite partners at JFNA, and we're honored to be a co-sponsor of these, this series. And I want to thank all 100 of you for joining today. You could have done many things, but you chose to be with us for the next hour, and we appreciate that. I want to begin with a little story, and that was one told to me by Ra Rabbi Naomi Levy, and she said, and when I went to see her speak, and she said, I'm sure it's the story, but she said that when a congregant who had a disability was invited to a, um, another classmate's house for a birthday party, uh, the, he had never been invited somewhere before to a friend's house, and so the mother said, thank you for inviting my son, but why did you do so? Um, um, and she said, because it's the Christian thing to do. And Rabbi Levy said, why isn't it the Jewish thing to do? So your presence today demonstrates that you believe that it's the Jewish thing to do, and we will provide you resources and ammunition in today's webinar to make that case. Uh, but for me, my Judaism is very, very personal. My late grandfather, who you see on the screen, Rabbi Jay Kaufman, was the head of the B'nai B'rith uh, International and also the number two at the Union for Reform Judaism, which was when he was there, was called the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. And uh, we've come full circle because I um, now have the privilege of serving on the board of the URJ. And my inspiration for being in disability advocacy and why I'm in disability advocacy is because my brother, uh, Jay, has cerebral palsy, but it's a more severe form than mine. And uh, he, it, we're very close and he needs assistance with showering, shaving and dressing. So he is the reason why I'm in uh, disability policy and why that related to the earlier slide is that he is a resident of the Jewish Foundation for Group Homes, if you could go back, uh, Eric. Uh, and I'm honored to be the secretary of the board of JFGA. A little further. Um, so I really, my, in terms of my Jewish inclusion uh, story, you can advance to the next slide. Uh, I really love that Judaism is the only faith, and Rabbi Tuckman will talk about this a little bit more, uh, that the main protagonist of the faith, Moses had a disability, he had a speech impediment. But in terms of what I do, um, I, am, I am a person with cerebral palsy, and I think that helps me in my advocacy because when I talk about being in special education, I can talk about being a special education teacher and a special education student, and I have a unique credibility that I'll get into more later. But I was a public policy specialist at the Arc of Maryland, which I enjoyed. It's obviously a secular or, uh, organization. So coming to JFNA four and a half years ago was a chance to combine my two passions. Um, and so I really uh, think that because I live with a disability um, that, uh, and I've been a disability professional advocate for so long, uh, that brings me a unique credibility because these are not esoteric uh, concepts that I advocate for or when I go on the hill. Uh, you know, like, like I said, I can talk about special education from the perspective as, of a student or a teacher or people that I know who are on Medicaid or uh, people that rely on assistive technology uh, to communicate their needs and wants. And I also really like that I, am busting myths when I go and I talk on the Hill. Because uh, society tends to believe that uh, people with disabilities can only serve in certain occupations, being a bagger at a grocery store, uh, food preparation, sanitation, all of those are fine occupations, but people with disabilities are a diverse group with a um, wide array of interest and ability. 
So I like the fact that I'm busting myths because usually when I tell people that I graduated from the University of Maryland, they say, oh, God bless you. Um, and meaning they didn't think that people with disabilities normally graduated from college. And I like working at JFNA because I fully uh, embrace my identity as a Jew and as a person with a disability. Thanks so much, Aaron. Now you had expressed as we were chatting and, and thinking about what uh, you wanted to share today that sometimes in you, your work you receive pushback that inclusion is somehow ancillary to or separate from the Jewish values of your organization and other organizations' missions. How do you respond to that statement? Well, I do encounter that a lot. And I think that that's because largely Ameri uh, American society is still uncomfortable. Back up, uh, please, on the slides. Okay. With, um, with disability, it makes them confront their own mortality. But what I tell them is a couple things. Um, again, like I said, um, Mo Moses, the lead, uh, the lead protagonist of the Torah, was disabled, but also that, next slide, a number of um, people, while I wish everyone a healthy and happy life, will join me in the Walker Club because of the fact that the baby boomers are aging and many people will uh, become disabled. You can't see it, but I use a walker to ambulate due to my cerebral palsy. And uh, there are also a lot of concerns about the expense related to accommodations and also liability. And I point out very respectfully that, um, that most accommodations cost nothing. And if they cost, most accommodations cost $500 or less. And lastly, I point out that if you fail to accommodate people with disabilities, next slide, uh, they, you will lose the whole family because of the fact that if someone's family member is not included, the whole family will disengage from Jewish life. So, and I lastly will say that sometimes I hear, well, it's not just people with disabilities, the LGBTQ community, Jews of color, they all want something in a synagogue budget. And I say, that's fine because People with disabilities are included in Jews of color, and some people with disabilities are LGBTQ plus Jews. So that that's how I answer it, Matan. Thank you so much, Aaron. And we'll have more time for questions to be posed to Aaron during our Q and A session. But now I'm going to uh, shift to uh, Rabbi Tuckman, who is going to uh, talk to us about how Jewish text, um, you know shows us that uh, it defines inclusion as a Jewish value. Uh, Rabbi Tuckman. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Respectability for inviting me to be part of this panel today. I feel incredibly honored to be here with all of you. And as Matan just said, I'm going to be doing a, a presentation of a couple of texts from the Talmud, um, which is a very important Jewish text. It's central in our tradition. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the fact that a lot of these texts or ideas on inclusion are actually not new. They're very ancient, and there are examples of them found throughout the Talmud. Um, so I'm going to start, if we can go to the next um, slide. I'm going to offer three texts today. Uh, and the first one of those, uh, the first text, is going to be talking about um, what we might call as an IEP, but I want you to make sure that you come away feeling that inclusion of Jews with disabilities is not new, but rather woven into our tradition. So put another way, when we talk about Jewish disability inclusion, we're not talking about something that we just decided upon in modern times or in the last couple of decades since the ADA, but in fact, this is woven into the fabric of our tradition. So I'm going to begin with an examination of a text from the Babylonian Talmud, um, which is found in a tractate called Eruvin, although that's not so pertinent for our moment right now, but um, we're talking in this passage about Torah study. 
And the, and the Talmud relates that there was a rabbi named Rabbi Parita who had a certain student whom he would have to teach 400 times, and only then would he learn the material as he was incapable of understanding it otherwise. So in other words, there's a student and a rabbi, and they're sitting together in a study house, and this student, for whatever reason, needs to hear the material 400 times in order to then be able to comprehend it. There is an idea here, we're talking about a society in which learning was done through hearing and listening mostly. And so this rabbi is dedicated to the student and sitting with them and making sure that they understand the material. One day they requested, so someone requested this rabbi um, to attend to a matter concerning a religious obligation after his lesson with his student. So Rabbi Parita taught his student 400 times as usual, but this time the student did not successfully learn the material. Next slide, please. Rabbi Parita said to him, what is different now that you are unable to grasp the lesson? He said to him, from the time that they said to the master, so the, from the time that they said to you that there is a mitzvah matter or a matter of a religious import for which you are needed, my mind was distracted because I was afraid that you were not going to want to teach me because your mind was otherwise occupied. So now I was worried that you were going to get up and leave after 400 times and I wasn't going to learn it. Rabbi Parita said to him, pay attention this time and I will teach you and know that I will not leave until you have fully mastered the lesson. He taught him again an additional 400 times. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons of this text? Different, differentiated learning. IEPs are talked about explicitly in the Talmud. So an IEP is an, is an individual education plan. Many students with a variety of disabilities have them. And we often think that they're a new thing, but in fact, we have an example here in the Talmud of a rabbi being aware that his student needed a differentiated way of understanding material. And he was dedicated to that student and made sure that that student learned. The rabbis of old care so much about a student that, they, that the teacher sits with them and explains the content 400 times. 400 is an important number in terms of it denotes, you know, it denotes for all of us a lot, but particularly in this context, it's really meant to say, this was so important, we're gonna make sure we teach the student until they understand it. Also key to recall that when the student expresses his fear that his rabbi will leave him due to a matter of supreme importance, the rabbi assures him that he will stay and teach the student. So often there's a sense of students with disabilities might feel like burdens, um, but clearly we have here dedication of a teacher to a student. Diverse learning needs have always been present. This student isn't a burden, but a joy to teach. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna move on to a text that is a bit different. Um, and this text talks about leaders with disabilities, specifically Torah scholars with disabilities. So the Talmud relates that Rabbi Judah and Rabbi Haya were walking along the road. When they arrived at a, at a certain city, they said, is there a Torah scholar here whom we can greet? The people of the city said, there is a Torah scholar here, but he is blind. So Rabbi Haya said to Rabbi Judah, you sit here, do not demean your dignified status and to go and visit someone beneath your stature. I will go and greet him. So Rabbi Judah, said, Rabbi Judah grabbed him and, and went with him anyway, and together they greeted the blind scholar. When they were leaving him, he said to them, you greeted one who is seen and does not see. May you be worthy to greet the one who sees and is not seen. Rabbi Judah said to Rabbi Haya, Now, if I had listened to you and not gone to greet him, 
you would have prevented me from receiving this blessing. Next slide, please. I want to make a quick note of language. I am anglicizing all of the words here purposely um, for purposes of accessibility for all. So I just want to make that note as we continue. So what are the lessons of this text? So Rabbi Judah, <clears throat> who compiled uh, the foundational text that the Talmud is based on called the Mishnah, um, some <clears throat> of the Talmud. So he, comp he compiled the Mishnah, that was the foundation of the Talmud. Someone of his stature goes to greet this scholar who is considered to be beneath, or considered to be by the townspeople beneath him. So the townspeople assume that someone like him would not want to go and greet the blind scholar. Valuing all leaders regardless of ability status is an important value. Don't assume that just because someone has a disability, they aren't worthy of being greeted or being visited. And it's important to note that by visiting this person by these two rabbis, they are going against the assumptions. People make assumptions like, oh, this person has a disability. It's not worthy of your time to go visit them. And we have a direct lesson here that in fact, because we value human dignity so highly and we value all so highly, that it is in fact very important to include all. The ancient rabbis understood the importance of social inclusion and recognition that blessing may be bestowed and received by all. Um, next slide, please. So our third and final text for this presentation um, is a text regarding the priestly blessing. And for this portion, I'm actually going to turn it over to Matan to give a quick summary of the next few slides. Matan, please. So oh, thank you, and we will start by reading uh, just the Mishnah part of this, which is a priest who has blemish is on his hands, may not lift his hands to recite the priestly benediction. Because of the blemish, people will look at his hands, and it's prohibited to look at the hands of the priest during the priestly benediction. Rabbi Yehuda says even one whose hands were covered with a blue dye might not lift his hands to recite the priestly benediction because the congregation then will look at him. Now in the Gemara they discuss this and we're going to summarize the discussion very quickly so we can get you back to Rabbi Tuck. And so first they start by you know sort of expanding on the number of people and a whole lot of differences and potential changes that appear to keep someone from being able to offer the benediction difference is in hands and in eyes, but then they go on and they say, but wait, wasn't there an exception in this person's neighborhood? And wait, wasn't there an exception in that person's neighborhood? And they say, yes, the exceptions are okay because the community was familiar with them. And then they continue to list even more exceptions. We get you know, story after story after story of a familiar exception. And then we get a generalized answer. They, they restate the Mishnah, but then they say it was taught in a Baraita that if most of the town's people are engaged in an occupation and like dying, or then, they, then a person who has died hands is allowed to recite the benediction with the with the implication being that it generalizes individuals with whom you're familiar and goes to a difference with which you are familiar. I'm going to turn it back over now to you, Rabbi Tuckman. Okay, thank you so much. So what are the lessons we might take from this text? At first glance, this text comes off as harsh, deeply hurtful, and exclusionary. The rabbis place the onus on the people. The person doesn't make the priestly benediction because people will stare, right? So we have this conversation that the reason someone cannot, cannot make the priestly blessing if they have blemishes on their hands is because it's a distraction and we're not supposed to be distracted. Then we start to see exceptions, as Matan mentioned, if a person is familiar in their town and thus people will not be distracted, it's okay for them to make the priestly benediction. 
If a condition or situation is familiar, maybe because of shared profession, it's okay. Next slide, please. Familiarity matters to the rabbis. Why might this be? What obligation does this place on our community with regard to leaders with disabilities? So I will say also that the thing to really uh, take away from this text, right, is that the rabbis here are deeply aware of human fallibility and human um, and how the human mind works. I think I think rabbis are I think the rabbis are quite familiar with human nature, and they determine that people are people and they are drawn to that which is different. And I believe that we can actually look at this text and say, the rabbis make make sure that actually people are aware of their own biases, right? That it's not about the person with the moom, that's the Hebrew term, blemish, um, which is not a great translation, it's not a translation that I like, but it's what we've got here. Um, but rather that we need to be focusing on the fact that we ourselves are drawn to that which is different and we need to be aware of our own proclivities in that way. And so that we have to become accustomed. It is our job as human beings to build more inclusive and accessible communities to become accustomed to a diversity of, human, of humanity within them. Um, so I wanna thank you again so much for this incredible opportunity to be with you all. And I'm going to turn it back to Matan. Thank you, Rabbi Tuckman, and thank you, Aaron. We're moving to the Q&A period, which means I'm about to stop sharing my screen so that you can see all of our uh, lovely faces. Um, and I uh, would offer two thoughts. One is, please, we've got a few questions in the question box already, but put your questions in. We want to hear from you. And just looking as the questions come in, I had promised the panelists that I might occasionally chime in as part of answers as well, despite my moderation status. Believe it or not, uh, Rabbi Tuckman, Aaron, and I have been speaking together for many years, so we, we mesh reasonably well. Uh, but I am going to start reading your questions to the panelists. Um, and this first question is directed at Rabbi Tuckman, and uh, I am not going to identify the questioners uh, unless you put this specifically in your question that you want to be identified. We'll assume people might want anonymity. Uh, thank you for sharing these texts, Rabbi Tuckman. I wonder, do rabbinical students generally spend time with these particular texts? I wonder how well equipped and empowered newly minted clergy are to tackle issues of disability and inclusion in their communities. And I'll direct that first to Rabbi Tuckman and I might have a thought to add. Um. Thank you for all the wonderful question. Uh, I would say to answer the first piece of it that my uh, answer is limited to, uh, to my experience um, of my rabbinical school. Um, and it really depends on the classes that you're in. I, I did not have a class in rabbinical school specifically around texts about disability. Um, I wrote about disability in a lot of my classes. Uh, there happened to be a lot of texts related to disability that were brought in a lot of my classes. Um, but I do think that there can be some room for growth around making sure that newly minted clergy, um, particularly rabbis and cantors are empowered to really tackle these texts. And that's um, something that I also do is really try to teach these texts in much more depth um, to clergy and others who are interested precisely for that reason, because I want people to be equipped with the reality that these are in the tradition and that we should know them and we should be very uh, familiar with them. I have something to add if I could. What's that? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I hope that uh, more uh, rabbinical professors and seminaries will take advantage of the text that Rabbi Tuckman has shared with us today, because I think, ladies and gentlemen, far too often people with disabilities are seen as people in need of charity and pity, and also that they 
at least in my experience, that people automatically assume when they first meet me a lot of the time that I must have an intellectual disability and therefore they speak to me in a baby voice. So what I like about Rabbi Tuckman's text is that it paints disability in a different light and I hope seminaries will take advantage of her skills and her writing. And I just wanna briefly say that it is such a joy to be on a um, webinar with Rabbi Tuckman, a childhood friend, and she is a trailblazer that hopefully will change the way uh, rabbis all over the country uh, view disability. And I would add, because Rabbi Tuckman does not seem inclined to self-promote, that she is uh, currently offering an in-depth textual series for those that are, you know, uh, interested in taking that sort of deep textual dive. Um, I don't sadly know timing and details. I can turn it back to Rabbi Tuckman to share that, but, uh, but I thought it was important part Thank of you that both. answer. Thank you both, Matan and Aaron. I'm happy to share. Um, I am doing a four-part series with um, the Matan Institute, um, which is a which is another organization that works on Jewish disability inclusion. And a co-promoter of this series. I and a co-promoter of this series. Um, on Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. Um, and there are there is registration information for that available on online. And I would be delighted to do a deeper dive into some of these texts with all of you. All right. So I, I just want to answer two things that were posed that are not proper really four of the panelists. One, someone asked if we would be circulating the slides, and we will in a fully accessible format. Um, the other was a question about uh, accessibility in digital forms, and I will say that we have another webinar, our Access to Events webinar, it's scheduled as a part of this series that will speak to that. So I encourage uh, the person that posed that question to sign up for the entire series and to join us there. Um, now, switching back to questions for uh, the panelists, um, so someone has pointed out that it seems like the advantages of familiarity uh, in the Megillah 24b text would extend to people with all differences, not just leaders. Can either of you comment on that? Yeah, I would say um, specific to the McGee Law text that we're talking about a particular ritual, but I do think we could expand that. Um, there are other pieces of Talmud that talk about whether a blind person can make the first blessing in the morning services. Um, and there's a whole conversation about do blind people do blind people benefit from lights? And it's interesting how the rabbis there have this conversation um, about whether or not blind people do or don't benefit. And ultimately they say that blind people do benefit. And um, But that's another parallel of the ways in which the rabbis are having a conversation about ritual inclusion in a lot of different ways, right? And so it certainly is something that I think applies across the board. And even more so that it, it galvanizes, I, I pray that it galvanizes us, especially um, in how we think about coming together as community to really tap into the wisdom, talent of all in our communities. Um, and that sometimes I think the rabbis are pointing out to us, and, and we hear a lot about this, especially now in these times, that we carry a lot of bias that we aren't aware we carry, but we have to work with that bias um, often people with disabilities, and I know this is my own lived experience as well, I think often a lot of people with disabilities feel like we have to make other people comfortable with us, that the onus is on us to make others around us want to be comfortable in our presence. And, you know, whenever anybody talks to me about that, I always say that the most important thing we can do as individuals is to be our most authentic selves, and that ultimately, someone's comfort level is so much more contingent upon their own internal processes around their own biases. And I think that that's what the rabbis are really asking in their own way and in their own context. I think that's what the rabbis are urging us to do as a people. 
Great. Thank you, Aaron. Anything to add? Or should we move on to I will leave the, I will leave the rabbinical text to uh, the expert Rabbi Tuckman. But what I will say just uh, is that I also have to constantly make people feel comfortable because you can just see it in their eyes. They're uncomfortable when I walk in the door. And um, so I will often make a joke about I'm the senior legislator for disability policy at uh, the Jewish Federations of North America. And then I have my walker next to me in a Hill meeting. And I'll say, and you can, uh, and I'm the senior legislative associate for disability policy at the Jewish Federations of North America. And then I'll point to the walker and say, for obvious reasons. And everybody laughs and the tension drains. But I hope uh, one day, Lauren and I will not have to, the onus will not always be on us to be uncomfortable, uh, to make people comfortable rather. And I just wanted to say something about the text. The text can say all that it wants to say, but I think people with disabilities in the Jewish community encounter rigidity and attitudinal barriers uh, all the time in the Jewish community, sadly. So we have a lot of work to do. For example, I spoke to someone who was blind and they were told, well, you can't read from the Torah because that violates halacha. And so a lot of people are rigid and they're not creative and that leaves a bad taste in people's mouths about Judaism generally. Thank you, Aaron. And actually that leads very nicely into the next question. But before we do that, I just want to pause because again, there are a lot of questions in the question box about the how of Jewish inclusion. I want to commend again that this is the first session in a seven part series that will be offered roughly on consecutive Tuesdays between now and early August that are going to answer a lot of your questions on how to accommodate, how to engage. We will definitely be there uh, for you for that. Um, and, but, you know, building a little bit of a what off of what Aaron just said, it, it's a real a good lead into the next question, uh, where the questioner tells us, look, you highlighted some texts in the Talmud that appear fairly inclusive, but aren't there texts in the Talmud that are somewhat less uh, inclusive? And how do you, um, do you um, respond to those? Yes, there absolutely are texts in the Talmud that are far less inclusive than these. And the way that I personally respond to that um, as a committed Jew with a disability and as a rabbi is to remember and remind us all that we are, as Jewish people, the inheritors of thousands of years of tradition. And those thousands of years of tradition have resulted in a lot of messiness. One of the things I love most actually about being Jewish is the fact that we don't hide our messiness. When you look in the Torah and you look in the Talmud and you look in a lot of different texts, there are things in there that are really hard. There are things in there that are really harsh. I have had to work through and gone, gone through my own process around a lot of those texts and I am sure there are more yet to come that I have not yet learned. And when it keeps me um, thinking about this in terms of thinking about how I contextualize, it's not about excusing or apologizing for, it's about recognizing that we are inheritors of a deeply human tradition with all of the foibles that, a hu that that has. And when I say human tradition, what I am specifically saying there is that the rabbis who compiled and edited the Talmud and later um, rabbinic literature are deeply human people seeking to figure out how to live in right relationship with God and right in right relationship with Jewish tradition and text. And so a lot of their own biases are going to show up. And that's really hard. It's, it's very hard. And it's also a gift. I see it as a gift because it allows us to have very honest conversations about the ways in which we are not where we would like to be on disability inclusion. I think there's often a tendency, particularly in more progressive circles, to say modernity inherently means progress. 
And I would commend to you that the world we are in now might put a bit of a lie to that argument, right? And all the more so in the realm of disability inclusion. So we often think the work has been done, we're moving on, but actually there's a lot of values that we hold, that we find in the text that we may not like, but we realize also show up for us. So we then have the sacred responsibility of working with our own inner lives and our own souls and figuring out, oh, do I hold this particular opinion? Why do I hold this particular opinion? What is coming at me from the text that I'm finding really abhorrent? And what is that reflecting in my own self? And how can I then work with both of these things? I am also, uh, you know, different people have different perspectives on this. Some people say, well, there's, you know, this is an ancient text and therefore the challenging bits of it that we have um, mean that I just can't engage. And that is a perspective that frankly, many people hold and there's good reason for it. As Aaron uh, beautifully discussed, Jews with disabilities experience a lot of rigidity in Jewish community. I, I absolutely um, also agree with that, but there's a lot of rigidity. A lot of the rigidity comes from a lack of education about how Jewish law works and Jewish tradition works, um, which is why we need to be empowering clergy to be much more competent in disability inclusion, both from a legal or halakhic perspective and from all other perspectives. But also I think that there's something to be said for really wrestling with the text. Jews are known as God wrestlers, um, really wrestling with the text and seeking to add a different voice to the text um, and saying, you know, what kind of values do we want to live into? What are the things that we carry forward? What are the things that we, we leave behind? And what are the things that we study so that we understand where we come from and where we're going? Thank you, Rabbi Zuckman. I want, I have want to direct our, our next question at Aaron, and it's sort of a synthesis question. You had mentioned um, that, um, you know, disability in, intersects with every other identity and that everyone, if they live uh, long enough, will join the club. Rabbi Tuckman taught us that the rabbis understood good inclusion to mean that the community would be comfortable with all manner of uh, different uh, differences that they currently uh, might not be. Noting the uh, diversity of Jews and the universality of disability, what does a Jewish community that lives by the value of uh, including and accepting all abilities look like conceptually to you? I would say, uh, Matan, that a Jewish community that is inclusive and accepting makes accommodations without me having to ask. Because I'm sure Lauren could speak to this, but constantly uh, advocating for yourself and having to be the pushy person that says, I need this and I need that. It's just so emotionally and mentally exhausting. So something that is truly inclusive uh, realizes that, hey, we need a Braille prayer book without Lauren having to ask, or we need a ramp to the Bema or look to the Bema without Aaron having to ask. And I also think it's in uh, attitudes because I think far too often people with disabilities are made to feel that their needs are a drain on the institution's financing, finances, and um, you, an inclusive community would do it with pleasure and not make somebody with a disability even subtly feel guilty. And the last point is that there are a lot of Jewish institutions that uh, have programming during the month of February, Jewish Disability Awareness, Acceptance and Inclusion Month, but to be truly inclusive, don't do just one inclusion shot and pat, pat yourself on the back for the rest of the year. Be inclusive all year round. So to tie that to the text that Rabbi Tuckman offered, and then Rabbi Tuckman, maybe you can, you can put a bow on the tie-in. It seems that what you're saying is that this becoming accustomed to that Rabbi 
Tuckman taught us in Megillah extends to the notion of creating as our community norm a place that has certain types of access and that just as uh, Rabbi Tuckman taught us in the first text, you know, the idea is not to look at a person with a disability as the resource strain, but rather as resources that we are happy to extend and not just financial resources, human resources, resources of our heart, resources of teaching uh, so that uh, the community can benefit and be stronger. Do you think that's a fair tie-in of the text that the Rabbi taught us with the with the point that you are making, Aaron and Rabbi Tuckman? I think absolutely. I think far too often people in society look at our deficits and not our assets. And when you think about it, that takes a toll on your self-esteem because if you're disabled, from moment one, you're labeled. Like you have cerebral palsy, you have learning disabilities, you're blind, you have... Uh, you know, emotional, uh, mental health problems, like whatever it may be. And I wish society would realize the old phrase, labels are for jars, not for people, and get to know us and focus on our many strengths. Thanks so much. We have time for maybe one or two more uh, questions. There are some in the box that are offering other uh, text ideas and wondering uh, if Rabbi Tuckman could comment on them. I'm going to summarize them together so that maybe she can address them together. Uh, one question asked how you believe that the concept of Dash uh features into our question of, um, of how to include the 20% of folks with disabilities and the responsibility of the community. The other asks how you believe that the scriptural injunction to remember that we were strangers in the land of Egypt features in. I think if you could give us maybe no more than a four minute or less response to that, then that'll keep us within the amount of time that we have, and then I'll have some closing matters to take care of. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna take the second half of that question. So, as some may know, in the Torah, there are 36 mentions of the idea that we must love the stranger, for we were once strangers in the land of Egypt. And that is often used in a lot of social justice circles in the Jewish community to talk about why we should do justice work, broadly defined. I think that it, that is the wrong paradigm to use when we talk about inclusion, because it reifies this idea that we are other, um, similar to what Aaron was just discussing. When you're somebody with a disability, you're labeled from the moment that you have, that, that it is determined that you have that disability. And that does take a real toll on the person's self-esteem, self-concept, it's emotionally exhausting for the family. And when we talk about we must include because we, we, love the, we must love the stranger for we were once strangers in the land of Egypt, we're actually saying to Jews with, with disabilities, we're going to include you because of this Torah idea, but we're not strangers. We're members of the community who are often felt um, like, we often feel like we are strangers. We are in fact part of Am Yisrael. We're in fact part of the, the nation of Israel, the community of Israel, the Jewish people, right? So, and I'm using all those terms because those are the terms used in the Torah, right? We're part of the Jewish people we're not outside of it. We're often treated that way. So I would not use that term. Instead, the paradigm that I use is thinking about a really um, common midrash. Uh, it's a scriptural interpretation that's used particularly about the holiday of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, which we just observed a few weeks ago, which says that every single soul, every single soul was at Sinai to receive Torah, meaning that every single person, past, present, and future was there. So if we want to truly include all within the community and particularly Jews with disabilities, then we need to remember that that, that comment, that text is encouraging and even demanding that, that we invite all of the Torah that we all received into our community. Thank you, Rabbi Tuckman. I'm going to screen share again so that I have the presentation for our closing. Uh, thank you to Rabbi Tuckman and to Aaron. I think you have 
educated us, you have shared with us. I believe that if you took a look at the comments in the chat box, you'd see that that sentiment is widely shared by those who have just had the privilege of listening to you and learning from you. And thank you for that. Um, this presentation, as a reminder, will be circulated to all of you and then will also be available on RespectAbility's website uh, captioned and with uh, the interpreter visible and as well as with a fully accessible PowerPoint in perpetuity. So if you have a friend that you think should see what we provided today, uh, very shortly you will be able to, uh, to do that. Uh, a couple of banners in closing. As I mentioned earlier, this is the first in a series. Uh, the next one, Inclusion in Jewish Education, which uh, you'll see shortly, will be offered uh, next week at this time. We really encourage you to sign up for all seven. Whilst I have the you on, I also noted that one of that several of the questions that we didn't address today because uh, a slightly different topic were about Jewish leadership and increasing Jewish leadership. And so I wanted to um, offer to you a quick discussion of a project here at Respectability, Strengthening Jewish Community Leadership uh, by Training Jews with Disabilities, uh, made possible by the University of the Jewish Community Foundation in the Los Angeles through a cutting edge grant. Um, and because of the COVID, okay, my presentation has jumped all around, but because of COVID-19, it is going to be available uh, to anyone who can log in to the trainings, any Jews with disabilities who would like to learn more about leadership. And um, with that, I will also say that RespectAbility is recruiting a Jewish inclusion fellow. Um, the slide appears to have jumped, but here you can, if you think you have someone who might want to work on Jewish inclusion with us this summer, they can find out more at www.respectability.org slash the rest of the link on this slide. And with that, I want to wish you all a very good day and look forward to seeing you for part two, how to advance disability inclusion in Jewish education. If you want more information on anything that we discussed today, feel free to contact me, Matan Kach at Matan K at respectability.org. If I can't provide it, I hope that I can connect you with the person who can. Uh, with that, I wish you a very good day. I thank our panelists one more time, and I believe that we can uh, call it uh, an end of the live stream. Thank you, it was an honor.